Good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Mary Ellen Slater, and I am your moderator here for today. And we're going to be talking about pay equity. And pay, specifically, we're going to be talking about how we gather all this data, how we make sense of all this data, um, and like also why we need to do this. Because uh, we've had the, the pressure to get this right and to get this um, together is, is actually kind of tipping up a little bit. We're going to talk about why, actually, in a few minutes, about why this has become an even more urgent issue. So, um, first of all, I'm going to bounce over. I'd like to introduce everybody. I'm actually going to start with with you, Eric, because you are a part of our host today here with Actaris. Why don't you uh, tell everybody a little bit about yourself and a little bit about Terrace? Absolutely. Thank you, Mary Ellen. Um, Eric Ryla. I'm Senior Vice President uh, of Business Development at Actaris. And I've been in the organization for a little over a year and a half. Uh, prior to being with Actaris, I have been in the financial reporting arena, uh, fintech space my entire career. Actaris, just for anybody that's on the, on the call here, we are a data analytics platform, and, and we do it very in a very unique Gen 3 manner of managing data disparately, giving it a home, a central place, a model, and then allowing tools like Power BI, Excel, the Microsoft stack to really do uh, uh, tailor to their strengths in terms of analyzing data from a central repository. So plenty more on that. I'm sure we're going to talk a lot about data today, but that that's that's me and I'll, I'll pass it on. All right, Michelle, what about you? Hi, everyone. I'm Michelle Durbin, uh, CEO at Skills Trust, uh, calling in from Dublin. Um, you, as you might be able to notice, it's already getting dark here, Dublin time. Um, the the kind of red thread running through my career over the past 15 years has been economic mobility. Um, I started out working for a government economic development agency and then most recently was a partner as an impact uh, focused venture capital fund investing in education and workforce development um, companies. And today I'm the CEO of Skills Trust um, and we're focused on a critical piece of the puzzle, which is pay transparency, our topic for today. And um, specifically, we're helping EU employers to prepare for the EU pay transparency directive, uh, which we'll cover in, in a moment. Okay. All right. And then Lydia, where are you coming in from today? I am dialing in from Bangalore, India. So if it looks very mm -hmm. shiny and bright, it's because I have what I call the Instagram influencer ring light right in front of me right now, <laughs> glaring in my eyes. So hi, everyone. Lydia Wu, uh, creator of Whoops, Did I Think That Out Loud? I have been in the HR tech industry for about 15 years at this point, working across the full 360 of the industry. Started out as a consultant went in as a HR executive in-house, worked on the solution provider side and also dabbling a little bit on the investor side as well. And what I'd love to do today is just to bring that full 360 spectrum together for the topic, particularly for pay equity in terms of what works, what doesn't, and what I've seen so far. I think one thing, I'm quick housekeeping, but if you have picture, uh, pictures, if you have questions for our panelists, please go ahead and drop those in the chat because we will, I'll, either, I'll be keeping an eye on that and I can either ask them in real time, but I can also, we can also save them, we're going to save some time at the end. So I'm um, going to bring those on over. So what, when we talk about this, the first thing I want to talk about before we even get into like what we actually do with all this data, um, I'm going to start with you, Michelle. I want to talk about why this suddenly matters so much. Like what is going on in the EU specifically? And I mean, also some US states as well that is making this suddenly so urgent yeah so there's big news here in the eu um, and obviously over the last number of years we've seen uh, many u.s states roll out pay transparency legislation and now the eu has introduced um pretty far-reaching directives so it was approved in um it was approved approved in 2023 and it's going to be coming into effect throughout the eu in 2026 so that's about 18 months away and as I explain what it entails, you'll see why there's companies are feeling quite a bit of time pressure to get ready uh, for this. So um, just in a nutshell, basically, um, you know, pay discrimination has been illegal in the EU for a very long time, for decades. But the challenge is that without information about what others are paid, it's very hard for employees to take cases. And so to try and address that, the EU is introducing this directive and essentially it's all about disclosure. So um, there's a few different ways that employers are going to have to share more pay information. And um, that covers, so that there's um, disclosures with employees. So uh, each employee will have an information right, whereby they can ask their employer 
how much others are making uh, who are doing the same job or work of equal value. So um, that, that's kind of one key point, and we'll come back to work of equal value in just a moment. Also, job applicants will have um, the right to know what the starting salary range for the job is before their interview, and there's a ban on asking about salary history. So that's kind of one set of obligations that employers will have. Um, the next then is public reporting. So again, we kind of come back to this concept of work of equal value. So employers throughout the EU, if you have more than 100 employees, you're going to need to report on pay gaps per job category. And in each category, it should be, it, each category should represent work of equal value or jobs that are of equivalent value to the firm. Um, and so the EU directive is saying that uh, in each category, you should not have pay gaps that are greater than 5%. And if you do, you have to remedy them within uh, six months. Otherwise, a joint pay assessment will be triggered with your employees. Um, so that's kind of the second bucket of things that employers need to do. Um, that's driving urgency. And then the third, which is really important, is around enforcement. So under this new legislation, when it comes into effect, the burden of proof will be shifting to employers. So if there is an alleged claim of unfair pay against you, um, the employer will need to prove that, in fact, pay was fair. So like that kind of gets to record keeping and uh, having very clear objective justification for pay decisions. So there's a lot to it, there's a lot more than that, but basically each country within the EU at the moment is in the process of transposing that directive into national law. Um, and at, at a minimum, they need to put in place those obligations that I've just uh, described. Oh, I think it sounds like a nightmare, honestly. Like I'm just sitting here thinking, not from the perspective of like, regardless of how supportive you are, pay equity and pay transparency. The you know something you mentioned earlier, Eric, you were talking about disparate data sources. This data lives everywhere. It's everywhere, right? Yeah. And I think about the questions we try to ask. And the bigger the company, the bigger like, and if you're mul working in multiple jurisdictions, like this just sounds crazy to me to like try to figure out how to do this. So. Lydia, I'm going to toss this over to you as the person who spent your career trying to do this. Like, why is this so hard? So in theory, it's not hard. I think um, you hit the nail on the head in terms of data being everywhere. That's what makes it so challenging, right? Normally, when you're kind of outside looking in on HR, you just assume everything is stored in the HRIS. While the salary survey data is usually in a different system, your actual payroll data, which is what's required to run a pay equity analysis, it's typically in a different system. You'll be lucky if it in integrates via API into your core HRIS in a two-way integration, but that's a different story for another day. And then you have your market benchmarking data that's sitting somewhere else. You have your job description data that's sitting somewhere else. And normally what ends up happening is that everything that is required for you to have a 360 view of the person, their skill sets, the job, their seniority, and their compensation is typically in a usual um, organization around like five to six different systems at least. Now, let's add in an additional layer of internal stakeholders because the party, which could be people analytics, could be total rewards that is tasked of running the analysis, is not always a party that owns the system in which all of the data is now required to be gathered. So every time you do an analysis, it almost feels like a political capital bargaining situation because you have to say, okay, who owns this system? Um, how can I get them to send me the data? Who owns that system? How can I get them to send me the data? And the beauty and curse of data is that the moment you get it, it almost expires because essentially the next iteration of data is being generated on the next paycheck, so on and so forth. So I think it's really a timing, um, a collation, as well as a ownership issue with most organizations when it comes to why is it so challenging um, to bring the numbers together. Eric, what are you seeing with this? Like, why, why this is so hard? I like well, yeah, Lydia just hit the nail on the head. I mean, and we deal with this all the time, regardless of use case. And this is, this is a very common tale in our world of, I need information from a lot of different locations, and it's generally happening manually. And when it happens manually, you got political stakeholders involved that now need to abide by a schedule to manually get the data into the environment. Um, you've got system limitations. 
I mean, for one, I mean, here's one example, like, let's say you want to just uh, overlay uh, performance, job performance data, and that's going to come from a different system than payroll. And because I want to start to recognize, well, job performance is obviously part of this. If I'm tasked with proving I'm not, you know, discriminate, paying discriminatorily, I need to say, well, hey, here's the performance data that proves that for me. So there's a, there's a lot of different disparate data sources. What we're doing here, what's in, I'll, actually, I'll Backtrack real fast. There's an art. I've been in the software space for a long time, particularly in the reporting arena. There are two impetuses for a new platform or a new solution to come to market. It's either you're offering an opportunity for a business to make more money or to uh, take advantage of a new opportunity, or it's to reduce or eliminate pain. And that's what happens when when it, when, when new regulations come along, and they're obviously for various reasons and very powerful and needed that is a i need to avoid the pain of this new way of doing things and i now need to response and prove things out your software is going to be a, a delayed reaction the solutions for pay equity analysis are going to be slow because it's not there's not a hey let's develop this because businesses are going to grab this because it's going to make them money it's going to be oh businesses are experiencing pain there's this new rule Let's quickly figure out who can bring a solution to market to help reduce this pain. The good news with a company in a, in a technology like Actaris is we're data agnostic. So it's really about now in the new way of technology in the old days, you would say, okay, where's the pay equity analysis platform that I can now procure to help me with all these initiatives? Or nowadays you can say, hey, I've got I've got Power BI expertise. I've got some SQL database knowledge in-house. I the, the tools are universal now to where instead of having this um, data aggregation be manual, just build an integration, have a SharePoint drop, get the data that you need from these disparate sources automated on a schedule coming into one singular source of truth, and then using technology like Actaris. What do you want to do with this data? What, what what algorithms are there? What do you, what relationships do you want to create from these different data sets? And now I can start doing scenario analysis. What happens if we hire 10 more people in the engineering department next year? How is that going to impact my balance of pay equity across the organization? There's just a lot of different things that you can now do once you have that consolidated environment. Otherwise, you're spending 90% of your time doing what you said, Lydia, which is, I need this data, and by the time I have it, it's stale. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but it's funny, though, Eric, you mentioned, like, people having a, going and getting this software. I, I When we were chatting about this coming into, like, planning for this session, Lydia dropped some, something on me that I'm still, like, Kind of like I can't believe it, Lydia. How do most people do this now? Do they go get dedicated software, or like what do they actually do? do no, it's else? actually kind of crazy. Um, just in terms <laughs> of you would call your legal department. So I've talked to a lot of HR groups and a lot of people, analytics practitioners, about this topic. It's like, how do you analyze pay, right? Because it's such a sensitive topic. There are legal ramifications and implications for all organizations to have these types of conversation. And inevitably, what I see happening is that instead of you getting a software as HR or you feeling empowered as HR to say, this is my data, I own this, let me figure it out. The first thing you do is actually pick up your phone and call your legal department and you say, hey, I got to do this thing because regulation says I got to do this thing. What do I need to do? Well, what do you think your typical employment lawyers are going to tell you? They're going to pick up the phone and call all of the external law firms to say, hey, we got to do this thing. Who can actually do this thing? So inevitably what happens is a whole bunch of file transfers happening over the ether, essentially, in a secure manner. But now you have company internal files that are being passed to external law firms to run the analysis, um, insert what I call the magic eight ball where they'll shake something through it, and then they'll return you with the results to say, based on our analysis and the data you provided, this is our opinion. You know where the raw data came from. You have no idea what happened in between, probably like the 70, 80% of it, and then you have a result. So going back to Michelle's point earlier, given the fact that the burden of proof will eventually be on the employers, it's a really hard conversation to have with the current processes. Mm -hmm. And and then what kind of files are they using to do this usually oh, that they're sharing back and forth? Excel, CSV, you know, <laughs> like the OG stuff, as I call it. <laughs> We're not that advanced. Well, what, what, I'm like, 
I know Eric is like, what, what? <laughs> I can't do that. Okay. What, what's wrong with what's wrong with spreadsheets? We all use spreadsheets and you should see my macros. Like I can do amazing things. What's wrong with spreadsheets? Either one I mean, of you I can answer that question. There, there isn't anything inherently wrong with spreadsheets, right? I think. But here's the thing. It's the periphery of the, at least my take, of what your lens when you're generating these spreadsheets, right? Like when you as HR generate the spreadsheets, you're like, okay, I'm going to give you the basic information. So who the person is, where do they work, their title, their job level, their compensation grade, da 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 what you're not taking into consideration is occasionally the performance data, if it's not in your system, where did they come from, their educational background, which is not always stored in your HRIS, and most importantly, it's the business impact that they're generating. Because here's the thing, it's incredibly easy to justify um, comp discrepancy, for example, in a sales workforce, if you can prove the volume, the productivity, their pipeline, their leads, so on and so forth. That stuff is in your CRM, it's not in your HRIS. So now if you have a comp discrepancy in your sales team, you have to take that discrepancy, walk it over either to your business partner, the leader of the sales team, have a full sit down with them, burn like two, three hours of everybody's time at minimum to then get to the bottom of it. And it's an incredibly inefficient conversation. I think it's also a the fundamental disconnect between why pay equity conversations still haven't been able to connect to the overall business results ROI type of conversations. Yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'm going to add yeah. to that. I want to add to that real quickly. I mean, because you mentioned spreadsheets, which is in CSVs, which is you know obviously near and dear to our heart here at Actaris. There's two things when I, I I see when I see a problem with a spreadsheet. First off, what you've said, Lydia, data can be stale. I guess spreadsheet, you don't know who's changed what, when, is there an audit trail? The data is, who knows? We're we're going to trust it, at least for our internal purposes, because we understand where it came from. We know this person, whatever. But if the burden of proof is now on the company to use this information to prove to a regulatory body, they have to, you got to, well, where is this data? A spreadsheet ain't going to cut it. Like, how do I know that this performance is legitimate that you're trying to prove to me when it's just from a spreadsheet that you don't even know where the data came from in a past hands three different times? I need to see the system data. I can't just take your word for it from a spreadsheet that made it into your report that your performance across the organization is equitable. <laughs> so I, those are, that's another thing for me, Mary Ellen, is like, if you're going to do this properly and you do need to be able to prove what you're what you're presenting you need to have an audit trail. You need to be able to say this is where this piece of disparate data came from because a regulatory agency, from my experience, ain't, they're not too uh, trustworthy if they can't figure out where the data came from. Yeah, I mean, mm. yes, we're talking about some of the most sensitive employee data that a company has, right? Like it's super high stakes and to have spreadsheets flying around the place um, is just clearly a bad idea. <laughs> Mm -hmm. It is a bad idea. And you think, will that be sufficient? I'm just thinking, Michelle, based on what you've learned already, even about the, the directive, is that is that enough? Like, is this what this process that we all just described, is that is that sufficient to meet the demands so, of the directive? Um, in terms of the burden of proof? I mean, okay, so here's what it really boils down to. Um, there's obviously the information that you need in order in order to do pay analytics. So as we've been talking about, like compensation data, uh, some of the demographics of the employees. But the piece that's really hard for employers, and this is from dozens of conversations I've been having with EU employers, is that like if you're a company of, you know, if you're not a multinational company, you may not have a job architecture in place or like a job leveling framework. Mm -hmm. And so um like when it get, when it comes to this question of burden of proof, like you need to prove that there, there's the question of the person and, you know, whether the person has been placed appropriately in the salary band for the job. That's one thing. But there's also just the question of like whether the job has been um, evaluated like correctly and objectively. And um, so, you know, that process of evaluating jobs, the directive specifies how that should be done. It says that jobs need to be classified based on the required skills, effort, responsibilities and working conditions. It's very clear, plus any other um, gender neutral factors that are pertinent to the particular business. 
And that, like, how, where do companies start with that, right? So, like, if you're a smaller business or even a medium-sized business that has no job architecture in place and you're being told that you have to run the pay gap analytics in this way and that it has to be defensible because of the burden of proof, it's very challenging. And so I think in terms of where we are right now, still 18 months out from the legislation, that's where companies are dedicated their time and energy right now is like how do I categorize my jobs by equal value in a way that's very defensible and reflective of reality within the business um, and then next up is this question of okay like why has this employee been placed at, you know at this point in the salary band because that also needs to be explainable several people have said to me you know the thing I'm most concerned about is my ability to sit down with an employee and in under two minutes explain to them why they're paid what they're being paid in a really clear simple non-technocratic way like that's kind of that's the goal that companies have right now facing into this i think that what this is uncovering you know i mean i know a lot of this with the pay the pay equity piece is what's triggering this but a lot of this is i think shining a spotlight on something that we all would have preferred not to think about at all um which is that we don't actually have great systems that actually set people's pay based on the value they create in their organizations. Even if we throw aside all the, and in the absence of that, I think bias is what winds up driving it. Like bias creeps in because we don't, it's it's not that people set out to underpay people, but it's like, we don't actually know. I, I think that like, even if, how, how do you determine those things? Like, I, I think that we've historically, in most organizations, they don't have a good sense of that. And Lydia, I would love for you to tell me I'm wrong. Like, do companies actually have a basic handle on that, at least? I think it depends on who you ask. And the reason why I say that is if you ask leaders in total reward space, they will tell you yes. And in their perspective and how in their context, I would agree with them in that they triangulate the data, right? So anyone will tell you the pricing of a job is a mix of arts and science. The science is trying to come up with a number. The arts is reading a job description and through your human brain, interpret what that means from a skill set, a leveling perspective, and map your internal taxonomy to an external search. May or may not use the language that you do in your organization. It's the best we can do given what we have. Now, looking at it from a pure statistical and analytics perspective, not really. It's the art part that I'm really, really uncomfortable with, quite honestly, when it comes to analyzing this type of data, because this is where I think the personal opinion and biases come in. So eventually you will narrow down to sort of like a plus minus 10% range, I would say, but depending on the experience of your compensation person, your total rewards person, handling that particular role evaluation on the day the job description was written, and also depending on how your managers and HR business partners wrote that particular job description, there is a lot of variability, I think, um, that you can create in terms of how you would describe one job versus another and how you would level a job versus another i'm i'm just, actually, yeah go ahead i was right. gonna say that's a great that's a great point because i think when you art can't be can't be very effective without grounded science behind it right like, like you need it we need to start and Marilyn, you said it earlier we need to start from a, a, a position of strong data that we believe in that's controlled that's that's live that's real so that we can use the art artistic factor accurately and know that that science is being represented correctly. You made, you gave an example, Lydia, about and this is near. To, I've been in business development my whole career. So when you mentioned a sales role, and how do we understand the equitability of pay across a sales organization that is obviously driven by commission and how much how much did you sell? Like there is not much more straightforward performance metric than the sales side of things. Well. That's a very simple example, but you mentioned the CRM data needs to be involved. I can't look at my HR system and determine that this person that's being paid probably significantly more than others in the sales organization. Why is that without the CRM data? So instead of waiting for my sales manager or somebody to scrape from that CRM system or deliver an Excel spreadsheet that we can't track, this is one of the things that we will do. And we haven't done it with pay equity specifically, but I'll use another example, the project management. We have clients that will bring in their HR data, their payroll data, then they will bring in their project management data from their project management source, their invoicing system. And the reason they bring all these data points together is because they need to understand 
what I paid this individual here, 26% of that was allocated towards project A, 14% to project B. It's not about equity, but it's about where am I spending this money on this individual and why? And that's actually going to be really relevant to, I think, the pay equity side of things, because think of somebody that's just working on projects. You need that data to understand how well they're performing across what they're being paid across the different projects they're working on. No different from a salesperson. How many deals have they closed? How much percentage of quota did they achieve? You're not going to find these in HR systems. Typically, you're going to need to find a very organized trackable, auditable way of getting all this data into one location so that you can deploy the art correctly. Yeah. You know, I mean, just and, a, as a little, just a little teaser to something that we're putting out later, but we did a, a survey of just, it was primarily focused on finance. It was fp and And we asked people what their biggest challenge was, like in terms of in financial planning and analysis, which winds up including comp in a, in a way and forecasting. And the overwhelming majority, like almost 80% said, it's data and accuracy and integrity. They don't even get to the other stuff. Like, it's like, they don't, if we don't trust our data and now we're going to be coming in and making these decisions. Like, so it sounds like, I, I think I know what everybody's homework should be for the next 18 months, Michelle. <laughs> it's like the prettiest report won't save us. You know, I mean, I'm just like, when I saw that, my heart kind of, I was like, hey, wow, 80%. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, one of the things I've been hearing, and I think this is a real implementation tension for the directive, is that like, so getting to this point that Lydia was making about art and science, there are job leveling approaches that are very detailed and points driven and appear more scientific. And um, that's great. But like we're talking about like in a lot of cases, like small and medium sized businesses, and it can take up to two hours to level a job using one of these point systems. And it's just not practical. And so I think that's the big challenge is like you need something that's objective, gender neutral, but also intuitive and easy for companies to implement. Because, you know, a lot of the people I've been speaking to are like, this is great. I mean, this is exactly what we want. People in rewards, I've spoken to several who they're like, you know, we don't want rewards to be this black box. We want it to be explainable and that this is a helpful tailwind. But there has to be tools to actually make this practically possible for a small business with lots of other priorities, you know. Yeah. And I think just in having this conversation in the past 30 ish minutes, what I'm realizing is that the way pay equity is being done today using existing systems and kind of current frame of thinking, we're sort of just looking at the middle part of the problem, right? Like the data that exists within HR. Let's analyze it. Let's grow it. Let's make sure everything is equitable. You're not looking at the input, which is what skills? How is that job evaluated? How did you get to? popping in those numbers to say that is that person's comp and that is their bonus. You're also not looking at the back end, which is what did that person generate? What did that role generate versus what are you aiming for them to generate? And what is that gap and what does that mean to the business? And I think that's sort of like those are two parts that's critical to the pay equity conversation that we're honestly not having in a lot of the pay equity analysis that we're doing. And my hypothesis, going back to Eric's point, is that we just simply don't have access to the data. So when you're saying, telling someone like, hey, you got two months to run a pay equity analysis, you work with what you have and what you have isn't quite enough to drive the conversation or the impact that it needs to have. I mean, I'm even thinking about, um, you know, I, you, you guys are the experts in the space, so you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm thinking about how, how, how far down the rabbit hole could you go once you have your data organized? Like maybe it goes all the way to, we can identify a problem hiring manager. This individual that has been interviewing people for the last year, they, the, their hires seem to be contributing to this problem. But, but how, do you, how do you get to that level of oversight and identification so that you can you know, kind of proactively before you have to do a burden of proof, before you're being grilled by a, regula a regulator, you can be like, I can identify where my problems are before they occur. And like, that's, again, how do you even get to that point without, without data intact and up to date? What's interesting, I mean, so when a lot of when we talk about dedicated system, this comes back to the thing we were describing. It's like at the basic level, we've got to just get our comp, we get that comp data. It's when we start layering other things in. But the the good performance management systems, your standalone performance management systems, and I think the big sort of modules inside the big HRSs all give you a means to perform calibration. 
right? They all have a means to kind of standardize that and hopefully identify some of those issues. I think AI is actually going to help with that a lot. I know we often think about AI in the context of you know, creating bias and contributing to bias and amplifying bias, but it could also help uncover, machine learning could help us uncover some of these patterns, but you're, I mean, they're nowhere near each other right now. So if you're using a tool like Betterworks or Lattice or, or even whatever, it's not necessarily tied. I mean, Lydia, I'm curious, because you do this, like, you know, you've done this for a living inside very large organizations, like, without giving away anybody's actual, you know, business, like, how common is it that people actually make their performance system talk to their total reward system? So I think if you prescribe to one of the larger um, sort of tech solutions, you mm -hmm. they're technically talking. And I say technically because you're entering data into the same ecosystem. The challenge, and I think the question we should be asking is, what are we using it for and what are we doing about it, right? And I think this goes back to your very initial question of like, what's the impetus? Why now? It's like two years out. Who cares, right? But the thing is, like compensation typically, at least for multinational organizations and larger ones, it's like a once a year exercise. You calibrate once a year, you pay it out, you budget for next year. So really, you have about one and a half, two shots to get it right right now. But more importantly, in, before you even get it right, it's understanding that performance is one data point, whereas compensation is an entirely sort of different concept, if you will. And in the mind of your workforce, it's sort of like a tangible exchange for the value that they're providing your organization. So if you think about performance as the output or the judgment on the value that they're providing the organization, then compensation is sort of that value that you associate with that um, uh, judge evaluation, if you will, on the performance side. And then kind of looking at those two together is where I think the magic happens. Whereas right now we're just saying performance equal X, compensation equals Y. And this is, I think, across the board what a lot of teams are doing just because it's a, a simpler way of looking at it, right? It's a more justifiable way to say, hey, this is why X is Y, and this is a very linear relation where I think this there's more of a third degree conversation that needs to be had across the board. And actually, it's probably worth just pointing out as well that the EU directive is asking employers to report on both uh, base and variable broken out separately. Ooh. And I think that's going to be the biggest gotcha, actually, the fact that you have to report base and variable separately, because a lot of times to make finances work, you're like, OK, if I go up a little bit here, where are my levers? What can I pull? Because in total, everything looks great and everything looks equitable. The moment when you break it out, I think, is where we're going to see a lot of wonkiness across numbers. Well, this is, I mean, I think this is really hard. It's like, it's funny with the beginning, we're like, it sounds really simple. It's like, how much do you pay people and why? But these yeah, are actually and that's, very. And it's, and it's a gen, it's a gen three reporting challenge because you know, mm -hmm. that when you talk, we, when we talk about the analytics platforms and we talk about maybe a point solution platform for pay equity analytics, that's where when I, I, I'll say Gen 3 probably a million times a day is everybody already today, and we've already talked about CSV files, so I'm just going to say Excel. <laughs> and we're talking about the data coming in to the environment. Well, now let's talk about what tools being used to now evaluate the data once you've got the data. Is it still Excel or is it maybe a business intelligence tool like Power BI? Whatever it is, those tools are quote unquote data agnostic. Right. People use Excel for everything. People can use Power BI for anything. But what matters is what the purpose of the data is and the model behind the data. So there's, there's actually a massive opportunity here just from this conversation today in the sense of that there isn't a platform yet for this. There's going to be a burden of proof. There's a regulatory agency that's looking for certain things. Well, this can be built in a Gen 3 business intelligence tool. And when I say Gen 3, what that means is Actaris enhances these tools to where you can not only visualize data, but alter it, change it, contribute new data to the model. So that's where when I was saying earlier, here's my here's my company, and we need to hire 10 more people next year, not for pay equity reasons, but for a new project that we're launching in the next fiscal year. I need to make sure that we're hiring appropriately. Let me create that scenario. Here's my existing company, all the people that are being paid, my pay equity structure. Now I want to create a sandbox of that environment 
And I want to make sure that when I do add these 10 people to my model, it's not going to break the metrics that I need to stay within to make sure that I'm not violating a, a pay equity regulation. So that's that's what we're and that's why I think that this conversation could go on for days in terms of you, Lydia and Michelle, because in your guys's heads, there's a here's the data that we need. Who cares where it is? Here's how it needs to relate to each other so that we can start drawing conclusions and meaningful analysis out of it. And then here's the ability for us to now to make changes and see if we're going to break or violate the parameters that we've set up that we're staying within but I can do some what if analysis to make sure that I don't screw it up. So that's that, that I mean, there's a, there's an enormous opportunity here, but there usually is when there's a, a massive change to the way we do things and how businesses need to report. Yeah, I think, I think it's a really interesting point. Like um, we've been asked by several companies, you know, like how do I sell this to the CEO? How do I sell the fact that like, this is coming, we have to do it. And like, I actually think that this is going to be a really interesting shift in the people function generally, because having to put in place this type of data structure around your jobs and skills, like, yes, you happen to need it for the EU pay transparency directive, but like, actually, this is like a really valuable fundamental piece of architecture to be able to do like, um, to have a career framework, you know, to explain to employees how to move up through the organization for workforce planning, for succession planning, um, you know, and even just like for forecasting your salary run rate, like and many, many companies, especially the smaller ones, don't have that right now. So I think the set, if anybody needs to sell it to their CEO, come to me, because I like honestly believe that it's a really, really valuable thing um, aside from the pay equity uh, aspect of it. Absolutely. Yeah, Actually, Michelle, it's a, it's another potential opportunity. I apologize there, Lydia, real fast. But now with 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 the uh, with the technology that you know uh, this Gen three can bring to the table, let's imagine that you have all your data in one location. You've got one tool. You've got everything you need and want. But now you decide I want something else. And let's say that something else is I want every I want every employee in this company to rank us on a scale of one to 10 if they feel that the company is paying equitably across the board. Well, how would you do that normally? You probably have to go get SurveyMonkey or get some other tool with which you would then use to send a survey out to your employees. They would give you the information it'd be stuck in some other database, it'd be somewhere else. Now I got to get it back into my model so I can make sense of that data. But Gen 3, fire up a report, send it out to everybody, and the inputs that they make to that report automatically flow right into the same database and model that you're driving all your analytic reporting from. So now you can enrich the data beyond what a regulator might need. And to your point, Michelle, identify an opportunity for the business versus just always looking over my shoulder. And the reason I'm doing this is because I don't want the stick to come hit me. You can now start maybe adding carrots to the model. This is why we should do this because it's the right thing to do and it's good for business. Look at the employee sentiment data that's now being married with all the metrics that we're bringing in. You can start doing these sorts of things from one database, one source of truth, if you're using a Gen 3 reporting analytics tool like Power BI Enhanced with Actaris. So that's, that's yeah, a great, great point there because I love finding ways to find carrots for the businesses to do this, not just the stick. And the stick is you don't you don't fall in line and you can't prove to us, here's the stick, you're gonna have to pay fines or you're gonna be whatever, whatever the consequences are. I love the idea of focusing on why is this the right thing to do and what can we do to make sure that this is like making our profits go up as a business because we're doing things equitably. That's where I think you're looking at it, Michelle, is like, how can we sell this to the CEO, not from a stick perspective, but from a carrot perspective as well? I think, you know, it's funny to the other things on my mind a lot as you were describing this, because you all mentioned this at different points in different ways from your perspectives. It was actually that communicating bit. I think this is what this, I think is potentially, it's very scary, but also transformative about what this directive requires. Michelle, you were talking about having to sit down and explain to somebody why they make what they make. 
you know, and I was thinking even Lydia, when you were talking about the total rewards people, like they love to make that when you, when you're making that job offer and you make that total rewards package and there's that little one pager that the good systems fit out and you're like, yeah. And then look at the value of this total package. Like I'm, and then Eric, you're talking about like, you mentioned the visualizations. I, I'm curious, like, I think there's an opportunity here for us to actually design like the pay version, the pay and performance version of that visually. Right. And, and like the charts need to be dead simple and I don't need to see everybody's everything. Like you don't sit down with that one, what you show an employee, like an individual contributor versus what you show a manager inside a team versus what a, a direct, like a division the head would see. They need very different views. I think that's like terrifying. I feel like, it's like but also like that's outside of pay equity. That's a transformative way to think about your comp. Well, I don't think it's terrifying necessarily because a lot of Maybe conversations I've okay, been getting into, you, but like a lot of conversations I've been getting into for the last couple of months yeah. is like, how do I bring HR back to the table? How do we bring ourselves back to having a say? How do I bring myself back to being the right hand person of the CEO, so on and so forth again? And I feel like we're neglecting sort of the critical element, which is pay, because a lot of times HR is very qualitative right it's it's kind of like what is your sentiment what is the engagement rate what is the net promoter score so on and so forth but compensation and pay is legitimately a line that is on your cfo's pnl it is a line that all of your business leaders see regardless of what sort of reporting that they're looking at within hr or outside of hr so it's almost like the perfect opportunity to shape a conversation to say like hey pay equity regulation aside as a leader you need to understand a very significant line in your business. Um, and in terms of what comprise of it, what value are you getting out of it? And how do you want to shape your business going forward in the future, depending on how you wanna leverage what exists within that line item? Yeah, I think that's precisely it, Lydia. And like that line is like 50% of all expenses for a typical company and that you could be more depending on the nature of the business. And so like, I think when we start to frame it that way and like the control that you get over that 50% by like having the right data structure and access in place is really powerful. That's when people like really sit up and it, it's bigger than just a piece of legislation, as you say. That is the way, I mean, it is interesting how in different organizations where that pay spend lives, right? And in terms of who is responsible for the planning, you know, I'm thinking about this, you know, Eric, you know, a lot of times like what well, Actaris works with HR, but mostly works with finance and like a lot of IT conversations, like that's usually who's driving it. Why isn't HR, like, I feel like HR gets the responsibility for the result without necessarily getting the chance to really own it a lot of times. Like HR gets well, in trouble when it goes wrong. Like when it becomes a lawsuit, it's HR's problem. But when it's, hey, I, can we balance out this, like these jobs? Like, I don't know. There's something kind of funky there, I think. But tell me if I'm wrong. Well, I'm, I'm going to marry two concepts together that you would kind of mention, Mary Ellen. The first was like the opportunity to develop the model, right? Like mm -hmm. the, if, if we if we have all the data, this is how it needs to be organized and set up relationally so that we can leverage it. And that's exactly what this is all about is that's that's like the middle piece, the model. What do we do with this information once we have it and that, and how it's presented? But what comes in front of that is where is the data coming from? And so the first step is, yeah, we could all write here today, not today, be a multi-day exercise, but we could we could come up with the model. We could be like, here's the data that we need in a vacuum. Here's the model and the relations that need that need to take place with that data. And then here's the pr presentation layer for the different roles, the individuals that need to see and evaluate this data. But now company A has HR system XYZ, company B has HR system ABC. They're both using different CRM systems. They're both using different project management systems. So we have the first part done. We know that once we have the data we need, we know what to do with it. But the data is always going to be coming from different places. So if you wanna have a technological solution, I think IT certainly needs to come to the table as a very willing and uh, motivated partner with HR to address that first part. All right, great, HR, you're telling me that you have a model, a reporting model ready in the box to like do what we needed to do for this pay equity exercise. 
but now we need to figure out where that data is in our company in what systems and in what format that that data exists because that's a plumbing exercise <laughs> so you gotta have the plumbing ex and the plumbing exercise in companies is done by <laughs> it or it's outsourced so there has to be a handshake i think at some point between hr and it to get to that first point because us on this group we can handle the rest but it's like where is the data what systems what formats how do we marry it together because us here we can take it from there <laughs> and i think the really critical point here too um eric it just related to something that you mentioned is the notion of security and access right like one of the scariest things in running a pay equity exercise are like oh did you password protect that file because not everyone should see it and when you release the results it's like okay well to what degree would they see the results is it aggregated at the group department organization subsidiary level or is it down to the individual level and i think from sort of like an output tool and Mary Ellen, to your point, like the model perspective, you almost need to kind of look at that third dimension of like, yes, I have the data, yes, I have the output. Now let's figure out who can actually see what and can the tool actually help me figure out who can see what in the entire pipeline or do I need to sort of manually export it and then share it out? Yeah, the good news, the good news is we have that covered with Gen 3 <laughs> because it already exists. You think, think of an FP and A team that needs to evaluate our the, the payroll payroll money payroll information is incredibly important when you're planning for the financials of a business but are they going to see what each individual gets paid absolutely not that's that, that would be violating a whole lot of rules so they have to be permissioned to only be re not only receiving the high level numbers from the hr system but let's say that's not possible let's say the data has to come in from every individual into the database in order to provide that calculation it's okay. You can permission that database with all that information in it to where nobody can see that granular data. We just want the calculation of the aggregate total to be available to the viewer. So there's a that that capability luckily already exists because very sensitive data needs to be a part of what let's say a financial plan involves, but not the granularity that would violate some of these privacy rules. Right. So I think let's think about this. One, there's, I mean, I think there's a lot of opportunity here. I do think that it can sound like a lot of work, like there's a lot of work to be done. You know, we've got some time. We've talked a lot about really the data foundations. And I'm curious, kind of, as we begin to wrap this up, I, I want I want a bit of optimism from each of you. I want a bit of, a little bit of advice. Like, what's that thing I can go do right now? I get off this call and I'm like, you're right. There is such a massive opportunity here. What is the next thing I can go do to begin to prepare for this? And I'm going to start with you, Michelle. What should people be doing right now to get ready? Yeah, so I have a really good one, I think. Um, so in a lot of countries in the EU, there's already some kind of gender pay gap reporting. So for example, in Ireland, that's the case. And the deadline is coming up. It's the end of the year. So actually, companies have gathered the data set that they will need, well, probably like about 80% of what they will need in order to do the type of reporting that the directive requires. So for my clients, what we're advising is that you take your data set that you've already put all the effort into gathering for this year's um, national report, and then you overlay your job architecture onto it. So you basically look at the pay gaps by category, by job category. Um, and if you do that, then the really nice thing about it, if you have a job architecture and you have a data set, which lots of companies have, um, and you run the numbers, then you can very quickly see if you have a pay gap in any category that's above the 5% threshold. And then you know, heading into 2025, okay, you know, it looks like we have an issue here. We, this is where we need to uh, remedy things, or this is where we have questions. Um, or whatever so i really really advise companies to do that if you have a data set that is close to what you will require for the directive go the extra mile do the extra 20 percent of work now and see how ready you are heading into 2025 and if you need to do any uh, preparatory work then lydia what do you what should people be doing first so Let's assume everyone's sort of like in, like if I were a HR generalist business partner or like a manager of sorts, what I would do is go on chat GPT perplexity, pick your weapon of choice, if you will, type in the question, what data do I need to fulfill a pay equity analysis? Get that list. 
And then you're going to take that, that. Hold you're up, gonna... hold up. What if it just makes, it's going to, I like complexity better than like chat GPT for this, but can I actually trust that? Well, it starts you off from somewhere, right? I okay, think it kind of okay, gets you okay. to that 80% mark and you can figure out the remaining 20% um, to what Michelle mm -hmm. was suggesting. Get that list. And then what you're going to do is go to your manager, go to your peer, go to your team. And you're going to ask the question, where do we have this data? Where do we store this? access to this data because I think step one before we even do anything before we even start pipelining it is figure out who do you have to buy coffees who do you have to buy lunch who do you have to have a sit down with who do you have to exert your political capital with to get access to that data set and make sure that data connector exists in order to kind of carry you into that next phase of it this is really interesting because I do think that this represents a big professional opportunity like for HR. And it is uh, when you're describing having to go buy coffee and how to go do all these things in the political capital. It's like data really is the currency inside these organizations. Like who has it? Where is it? Who can access it? What can they do with it? Because it's like we have all the data. Like, I mean, we have so much data. We have an incomprehensible amount of data about ourselves, about our employees, and we're not making decisions based on it because. People, I think in some cases, people, it's, I don't think it's usually like people want to control it. I mean, there's some control freaks out there, but I think it's mostly just not even knowing that we have it and not knowing what's in there. Like, and then you have to go negotiate for it because once people realize they have something valuable, and it's like, what are you going to do for me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> are you about to make my life harder? Are you about to make it easier? Hmm, I don't know. So, all right, Eric, what's your advice? I'm going to take it one step further. It's everything that the, both of both you, Lydia and Michelle have already said. And then the, obviously from the data side, I'm going to take it one step further is you're not going to probably have a Gen 3 tool in place initially. Or, you know, uh, kudos to the organizations that are that forward thinking. And hey, before we do what you just said, Lydia, we want a Gen 3 utility in place to help us with this. So they're going to start with what you just said. My additional advice would be document, document, document. And what I mean by that is, OK, I know the data that I need. I've determined this is where it exists throughout the organization and how to get to it. Now, make sure you are documenting how you are getting it and measuring the cost that is now being added to the company to make this process happen because that's what's going to lead the HR department to being able to very quickly get better tools. Because right now the tools we're talking about are CSV files and it's gonna be stale. And there's all these, even if we know where the data is and we're able to get to it, we were still saying earlier that it's gonna be stale and there's all sorts of challenges, even if we get the data. So in anticipation of hopefully getting a tool that makes this process way easier for the organization, start building your business case right away. Here's the documentation of what we have to do to get the data in this company, and here's how much it's costing us and how much time it's taking for us to deliver these results. You'll probably pretty quickly get a CEO or CFO that's like, this is a mess and we need better tools with which we can streamline this operation. Mm -hmm. So. <laughs> All right, well, so we have four minutes left. Do I have any questions? from our, our other our folks who joined us in here for this session today. This was very good. This was like very informative for me. I mean, I've been writing about this stuff, I feel like for 20 years and I feel like this is such a fast moving thing. And I think the opportunities, I mean, it's being driven by regulatory requirements, but I think it's opening up a lot of opportunity for us to have a better, you know, we talk a lot about employee experience and we talk about performance and all these things, but it's like the doing what we need to do for the law here will actually give us a lot of other insights if we, if we, you know, do that, do it with that kind of man mindset, you know? So, all right, last uh, sort of question to anybody in the chat, you can drop them in. All right, I guess I everybody's figured out all of their data stuff. So, um, parting words. Actually, you, we want to ask questions of each other. <laughs> Eric, what's the question you're dying to ask Lydia? Like, this is your moment. You've got it. <laughs> so, I'll, I'll ask one, Lydia. So, you yeah, heard yeah. me kind of talk a little bit about you know, Gen 3 tools allow for scenario modeling. And I was kind of throwing out my own, you know, stupid example of I got a new project next year, I might need to hire 10 people. Like, what would be some of your examples? If you had that ability to say, now I can actually start forecasting or building scenarios with which I might fall out of compliance or whatever it might be, I'd love to hear what you would do with a tool like that. 
Yeah, for sure. I think for me, it really comes down to two key parts. So one workforce planning, which you just mentioned, which is what is your productivity expectation of the company next year in terms of revenue, product production targets, whatever it may be. And then like mapping your resources to that and understanding the approximation of how much your resources are going to cost. Um, the other thing I think is really important for me is marrying the concept of org network analysis into this whole data set, right? Because a lot of times people's official role in organizations today are no longer their actual roles. Like you have these linchpins in teams. I'm sure we've all experienced and work with who contribute so much based on their network, who they know and so on and so forth. But they might just be in a junior analyst role. They might be in a role that's not been that they're doing that. And I think once you start layering org network data above everything else, you now have another layer of richness to understand, one, how to navigate your workforce into that next set of business strategy for next year. And two, understanding that compensation is not just about what they do, but also the network that they've built across the organization and how they are able to elevate their teams in addition to what they do. Awesome. I love it. All right. Michelle, you got a question for, for either of them before we part? No, just kind of like, I, I guess, um, building on that, I think one of the really interesting things about this for me is like, I've been kind of watching the whole shift to skills based organizations for like a long time, you know, in my previous role um, in VC, we invested in a lot of upskilling and reskilling platforms kind of found that like many companies want to be a skills based organization, but like kind of didn't have the killer use case to get started with it. And I think this is that I think like this problem of like, how do you level jobs? How do you map the skills? How do you decide where a person like sits on a salary band and explain it is a really good application of for, for a skills based organization. Um, so that's kind of what one of the things that I think is most exciting um, outside of the immediate pay transparency aspect. Oh, I feel like we can have a whole other session about the skills based hiring. Everybody's saying skills based this, skills based that. Did we are we hire for the attitude, the cultural fit? It's like we're just in the middle of this swing of like it, we don't know what we mean by these words. I don't mean you. I mean, I don't mean everybody this call, but like in general, like out in the world, like what employees think we mean when we say those things are not necessarily what we mean. Like when we say them in HR, I think that's. Yeah, that'd be hot as a buzz, buzzword at the moment. Mm hmm. Yeah. And I think that's um, and I think it's interesting because I think we, the communication piece of this is going to be so critical. I think that's the part of it. We think about the data and we think about getting all that data. But I'd say my advice would be to just step back and plan for the end in mind a little bit, like think about what you need to tell who and begin to, as you're gathering stuff up and cleaning up data and figuring out all of the models and all that stuff, like I think if you can't, you should be able to tell me in a couple of slides, like who is going to need this information and then in what format, like it should be. And that's, I guess, communications first in the marketer in me, because you can do all that work, but if you can't present it the board needs something different from your functional heads, like from individual employees. And I think if you can do the work, some of that working backwards, you might find that it helps greatly simplify some of the decisions that you have to make coming in, like to all of that. Because otherwise it's just like so much data. Like you don't need all of it. Need all, of it. <laughs> so, all right. Well, I want to first of all, just thank you all so much for giving me this hour. This has been very educational for me personally. I want to thank all of the folks who joined us over in the chat here. We've dropped our LinkedIn profiles. I encourage you to come and connect with Eric and Michelle and Lydia, you know, and send them questions. If, you know, any questions you might have, um, you know, Eric's great. Talk about Actaris specifically and how to, if you've got questions about your data and like making any of your data come together in any sort of like meaningful way, whether no matter what it is, if it's CRM data or performance management data, Eric can make it all talk to, you know, everything else. Um, with Lydia, Lydia is both is working, you know, in people analytics. I feel like whatever dumb questions I've ever had about people analytics, she always cheerfully answers. Um, and then with Michelle, if you're looking for, you know, guidance on what to do about this pay equity, you know, and this directive in particular, like she knows more about this, I, honestly, than anybody that I, I, I have encountered uh, talking about this, like, in, and in a very fact-based way, not in a panicky way, like, you know, okay, now here's what we're going to do. So um, I encourage you all to reach out to them and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks.